So this has actually been studied so much and by so many different people. Don't worry that you're not supposed to read that. It's just supposed to be overwhelming because these are the 21 <laughs> different versions of the delay discounting function that are in use throughout the literature um, all over. Some people prefer the hyperbolic, some prefer the exponential, some people like the arithmetic, some like the quasi-hyperbolic. It depends on which discipline you, uh, you basically grew up with, right? Which one were you taught? And this is what I mean when I say Organizing these things creates difficulty in trying to have really constructive interdisciplinary conversation about questions. We're all asking the same questions, but we have such different ways of trying to answer them that it becomes difficult to really work together across disciplines. So this is where we get to see all t of the first 20 can be reduced. Doyle, in 2013, um, reduced all of these to one common theoretical statement. And what this means, if it will come up, is that the discount rate is essentially mapping objective value and time onto, with each, each one has a subjectivity parameter, little s and big S, and then the change values interact in some way. So that's just a generic operator. So all this is saying is that um, value and time are altered by some subjective function in our mind by individual processes and then those changed uh, values interact with one another to give us our subjective discount rate. Okay? And all of those discount functions are different versions of this which make different assumptions about little s, big F, and the operator. So a researcher could say, well, I think big S is logarithmic because I agree with Zauberman or they can say, I think it's exponential because I think Stevens was right. And people have been arguing about that for 20 years, but at least in this format, we can have that argument a lot easier because we're all starting from the same construct, right? And it applies across all the different ways of approaching the discount function. So this is our first glimpse at the Rosetta Stone. Now, if you hadn't noticed before, psychological distance is trying to map the objective onto the subjective as well. So if we replace that subjectivity parameter of time with psychological distance, that D is distance and the subscript P is for psychological, okay? So that's what I'm calling psychological distance. All I've done is taken the same theoretical construct and instead of just putting the big S in with time, I'm saying, I think it's a function of psychological distance. But this is important, it's one tiny little change but it affects the usefulness and the flexibility of the model incredibly. Because uh, psychological distance doesn't just have a time parameter. It also can gather information about space, social probability, and the interactions between them. So now we're back to the model that I started with in the beginning. And this is where it starts to get really interesting, and I'm going to give you some examples of how this would be used in different interdisciplinary contexts and how it can explain some of the things that we've already seen. But I want to stop now and take questions up to this point just to make sure that everybody's um, ready to move forward before we do. All right, so this is the model. And now I want to talk about the flexibility and how it can be used um, in different disciplinary contexts. Um, so if we use psychological distance, then um, we can create models that incorporate any or all of the subjectivity parameters of psychological distance. So if you imagine that you're doing an experiment where you have somebody choose, are they going to take $10 today or $20 in a month from now, then you only have information about time and value, and that is the discounting function. And so this is essentially a special case of a larger psychological distance function where since we don't have information about the other conditions, the other parameters, we just set them to the identity and they drop out of the model. Um, but if you wanted to know, for instance, how people value public and private goods over time, the discount function can't handle that. But the psychological distance function can. Because in this case, we just add in the social distance parameter. Is the payoff going to me? Is it going to my community? Is it going to a stranger? 
those are all different measures of social distance. So social psychologists can come in in a very meaningful way and help us understand how social distance may be affecting the way that people are discounting the value of their public and private goods based on all the research that they've done on social distance. And that, that um, module there gives them a place at the table to really add a lot to it. And um, another thing that social psychology adds to this is that there's been a lot of research on um, I, the identity theory and especially Belk wrote a paper that was phenomenal on possessions and the extended self where he showed that when something becomes yours, when it, you, you own something, you actually integrate it into your sense of identity. So now it is a part of you. Where like if somebody gets their bike stolen, they feel like they've lost a part of themselves, and they'll say, they'll say, I, they didn't, st you know, I can buy another bike for a hundred bucks, but that was my bike. Do you know what I mean? It feels like a part of themselves, and so they're losing something more valuable than just the objective value. So this is something that we call the endowment effect. That when something becomes yours, you then value it more than something of equal value that's not yours. And Kahneman and Tversky won a Nobel for their uh, value function and prospect theory, where they showed that losses are more painful than gains of equal value are pleasant. So losses loom larger than gains. And so they say endowment effect is due to loss aversion. So they can explain that when something becomes your possession, you value it more than something that is not yet your possession or belongs to someone else. But they can't explain why. The psychological distance model explains why, because it's based on a deeper theory, saying that if something, if Belk is right, and something that you own becomes a part of you, then it's going to be very socially close, psychologically close. It's a part of you. So it will definitely be overvalued, it, or valued more, at least in comparison to something that belongs to someone else and is farther out on the social distance dimension. And so, theoretically, we should be able to produce the, the endowment effect with the value and social parameters of the psychological discount function. And this is one of the empirical tasks that I'm going to do as um, a second paper in my dissertation, is to, to see if I can do that. Um, and for all you GIS people, we can add in um, the effective distance on valuation. We can add in uh, the probability by putting in the hypothetical dimension. But um, the bottom line is that we can start to have more of these conversations with more people at the table if we have a common structure to work from. So um, I just want to show one more thing that's interesting to me. Uh, because when, as I was doing a lot of reading on construal level and psychological distance um, and behavior and self-control, something came up that I couldn't explain. So remember, psychological distance and construal level are very, they're parallel concepts. They work together. So if we just put our little model on there. Um, now one study that was done, they took people who um, tended to be very low-level construal thinkers, very detail-oriented people, and put them in one group. And then they took people who tend to be very abstract, high-level, big-picture people, put them in group two. They gave everybody a common goal to save for a vacation in three months' time. But with each group, they told half the people to have a very specific, low-level goal, save this amount of money per week. And the other half to have a very high-level goal, save as much as you can. Okay? And what happened was that the people who, on the on everyday things, tended to be very detail-oriented, the ones in that group, that the, the ones that saved most, were the ones who forced themselves into a high-level control, into an abstract goal, save as much as you can. And the ones who tended to be living over on that far end of the big picture saved more when they forced a very specific savings goal of a certain amount of money every week. And so what I think is happening in that is that they, the people who saved the most were p forcing themselves to out of the psychological extremes into what I like to call the rational zone. And this is where the objective and subjective values are most closely aligned. And so um, another way that we can look at this, maybe spatially and socially, is that when three people in Boston are killed in a bombing, we are horrified and we lose sleep and we're very upset. But when 22 people, including young children, were killed yesterday in a cafe in Baghdad, we hardly noticed because they're culturally and spatially very distant from us. 
And so these valuations really affect how we see the world. So the bottom line is that if we use psychological distance as a theoretical construct, then we have a mechanism to bring together psychologists, economists, financiers, marketers, even physicists and their knowledge of how spatial rules work into a really meaningful discussion about choice theory. The modular nature of the model uh, gives everyone a place to add their insight and the value of having one structure that's common to several fields is, it makes debate and collaboration much easier. Um, there are, of course, some issues with the model. Um, one important one is that we don't yet know we don't yet know um, how the different dimensions of psycho psychological distance interact. There's been virtually no research into that. One paper showed that if you um, prime on the social distance level, then people it affects the other dimensions, but not so much the other way around. But that's one paper. Um, that doesn't really bother me though, because I need something to keep me busy for 30 years. So. Um, <laughs> But the, uh, the other thing that uh, Mario brought up that I think may really bother some economists um, is that if we do adopt this construct, then what we might essentially be saying is that if we don't have information for one or more of the components and we set them to the identity, then our estimators might have unobserved uh, variable bias. Because what we're saying is that all these things affect choice and if we don't put them in our model, then we're kicking it into the error term. So that could be a sticky thing for some economists. Um, so, and the other thing is that, you know, it doesn't give us any answers as to how, you know, the specific form of any of these things. It's just a construct from which to build and test new models. Um, but regardless, um, I think that uh, the point is that we can start to have these discussions and debates. Um, if we have a unified theoretical form to start from. And in all of my reading and puzzling over this, I haven't seen a better candidate than psychological distance for that construct. So, I love this quote. It may not be true, but I hope it's well conceived. <laughs> <laughs> and so with that, we've got uh, almost 10 minutes for discussion.